Uh, and by the way, I'll be putting up a whole bunch of references, and at the end of the talk, I'll be just giving you a link so that you, you don't have to scribble too many notes. But in this paper, um, we modeled an analogous montage, and what we found that, that consistent with the clinical neurophysiology, when you go to an extracephalic electrode, you actually get less current in the motor cortex. You get more current in the brain, but less in the motor cortex because it essentially slips along the side of the head. So unless your target was, let's say, the temporal regions uh, and not motor, you would be actually getting less modulation. So this was a nice example where the model and the clinical neurophysiology worked very well together. Uh, and indeed, Dr. Freckney and colleagues ended up running a transcranial direct current stimulation study, a pilot one in fibromyalgia patients, where they use these models um, um, to explore different doses. And in the case of fibromyalgia, the nominal target is the motor cortex. And, and they looked at both uh, cephalic and extracephalic. And again, what they found was consistent with the clinical neurophysiology and the modeling, that the montage where you went to an extracephalic location produced less of an effect, consistent with less current going through the motor cortex. And so what you're seeing here is sort of a convergence of modeling and clinical neurophysiology, uh, as well as clinical trials. Uh, and so this is a theme that I'll, I'll be dancing um, around. So why should clinicians use models? And, and um, Pedro did an outstanding job of introducing this. As a clinician, uh, or as a, someone conducting a cognitive neuroscience experiment, you could control the dose, the TDCS dose, and that is what's on the outside. The electrodes, how many they are, where you put them, how much current you put in them. And as Pedro illustrated, what is on the outside is not what's on the inside, yet that is what you want to control. And models are what link the two. They link the dose to the brain current flow. And so a great analogy for that would be maybe with drugs. Certainly it's understood that when you give someone a, a milligram of a certain drug, you do not get a milligram in the dorsal hippocampus. Right? It, it doesn't work that way. The, the body processes it, and you get a transformation, and some amount shows up in the hippocampus, and some amount shows up everywhere else. It is exactly the same thing with, with TDCS dose. You control what's on the outside, that is what you control as an operator, but what shows on the inside may be very different, and it's due to the transformation um, uh, caused by the body, and so that's what we're comparing. We're comparing what's on the outside to what's on the inside. Uh, and Dr. Peter Jeff led, led an effort to, to try to consolidate really what we mean by dose and non-invasive brain stimulation. Uh, so I would, I would suggest you um, might uh, consider this reference. So uh, as Pedro already hinted at, you can use big electrodes or you can use small electrodes. So the, certainly most people are using large electrodes, either pads that are five by seven centimeters, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. You can also use much smaller electrodes. In this case, these are uh, specially designed gel-based electrodes um, or high-definition electrodes. Uh, and it's very important not to just take a sponge and cut it up into a little piece and put that on the head and pass two milliamps. That's a very good way to get a burn. Certainly, uh, the electrodes that you need to be using when you go to smaller sites need to be designed for the task. And so I did want to flag that up, I think, for both... Uh, I think you know the field is generally very cavalier and pushing forward and, and doing whatever it takes to get it to work. But I think with electrodes uh, for all forms of non-invasive non brain stimulation, we need to be increasingly vigilant uh, about how we design the electrode. It's not the same if you get it at you know the hardware store if you soak it in saline versus if you soak it in tap water um, uh, and so on. And, and this also, by the way, applies to sham. You can't extrapolate across sham because the electrode design will affect the sensation. So I, I did want to flag that up. So getting to the real question, now if you're convinced that you might be interested in using these models, how do you go about it? Uh, and essentially it's, it's, it's a very straightforward process. You would determine the brain regions that you are interested in, or the multiple regions, or perhaps the regions you want to avoid, and then you would use the computational models to determine the best dose, rather than just using your intuition. Um, and so this spells it out in some more detail. You, you begin with your hardware. So you have hardware limitations. That's simply what you have on, on, on the shelf, right? That's what you have to grab. You may have a two-channel stimulator with just one anode and one cathode. That would be your constraint. You may have a multi-channel stimulator. Also, depending on the types of electrodes that you're using, these electrodes will be rated for different amounts of currents. So there are some, some constraints right off the bat. The second thing is you need to determine what you want to achieve. 
And yes, you certainly have your target, but it's not quite as simple as that. Page already alluded to the fact that there's issues with directionality. So whether you want inward, outward current or sideways current, you will achieve a different best solution. If your goal is to achieve maximum targeting, so really just get that region you're interested in and avoid everything else, you will get one solution. But if your goal is to achieve maximum intensity at the target, and you don't care what happens everywhere else, again, you'll get a very different solution. So there are many criteria you might consider, um, and then when you combine your hardware limitations and your criteria, you end up with your dose. And the dose is essentially where you put the electrodes, how many you have, and how much current you put into each one. That is sort of the, the, the recommendation that will be produced by the models. So that's a general example. Um, and, and by the way, I want to, and this is not sort of a, this is not, this is not necessarily a trial and error process. There, there's, a, there's sort of a single best optimized solution based on your criteria. So thinking about a specific uh, example, uh, let's say you're interested in not having that many electrodes because it's a hassle to set up electrodes on, on the head or your <laughs> stimulators uh, are limited. You do not want to exceed more than two milliamp per electrode because that's conventionally uh, what has been shown to be tolerated so far. Uh, for 20 minutes of stimulation, and you want to target one cortical region, one cortical region of interest, let's say it's uh, motor or premotor or visual, but it's one region that, that's on the surface of the head, um, and you want to get as much electric field into that region as is typically done during TDCS protocols, as Pedro just alluded to, it's about 0.3 volts per meter. Um, and you want unidirectional modulation, that means that you want either just inward, or just outward and none of the other. So the solution to that is the 4x1 high definition montage. So this uses five electrodes, and you can see that there is a, a center active electrode surrounded by four return electrodes. Now if the center electrode has two milliamp, that means the outer electrodes will have the remainder, which this is will be 0.5 milliamps. The radius of the ring, so you, you said you, you put the center electrode over your target, the radius of the ring, how wide you make it, will determine how big of a region you affect. So essentially the, the, the cortical region uh, projected under that ring will be the region where the current flows. Um, and that was the uh, initial uh, model prediction. Uh, this shows that in some more detail. This is again a, a 4x1 montage, a, a computer simulation. And we're looking at two situations, one in which the center electrode is an anode and one in which the center electrode is a cathode. And you can see that in the center anode case, the current is dominantly inward, that's the red, while in the center cathode case, it's dominantly outward. Now, of course, you everything flowing into the brain has to flow out, uh, so there's a net zero in and out, but it's the, the montage, as Pedro illustrated, uh, causes essentially a, a diffusion of the return current, so you can achieve this, this unidirectional modulation, and moreover, you can make that ring smaller and smaller, um, and this is one of the uh, early clinical trials uh, that has been uh, using this montage, again, uh, looking at fibromyalgia with motor cortex as a target. Uh, this is another uh, relatively recent paper uh, looking at this montage and looking at its ability to modulate uh, TMS evoked MEPs. This is a very classic way to examine the effect of TDCS. And what was done in this case in, in, in a crossover manner was to compare conventional TDCS, so those are the large pads, with 4X1 uh, uh, TDCS. And for me, one of the most striking things was the difference in time course. So here's the conventional uh, TDCS uh, leading to a, a post-TDCS uh, excitation in the motor cortex as measured by MEPs that then decays over time. In contrast, when you, for example, use a nodal 4X1, there's actually no significant effect immediately post-stimulation. But if you continue to track motor cortex excitability, you see that it accumulates to a maximum at approximately 30 minutes, and this was larger than the effect on average that you saw with conventional, and the study actually had to be extended out beyond two hours, because at two hours, these effects were still significant. And so the point, uh, one of the takeaway messages from here is, you know, people always ask, well, is focal better? Do you want to be focal or not? Uh, I think what this experiment shows is when you go from a very diffuse montage where current is flowing through uh, you know, a third of the brain, half of the brain, including deep brain structures, to a more focused one, the resulting neuromodulation may be categorically different. Um, another recent paper looking at the 4X1 montage, 
Now in this case, what was done was not TDCS, but TES. So this is instead of one milliamp, a thousand milliamp applied for a very short period, and this will actually induce a motor volt response, an MEP, just like TMS will do. Now the models predicted that when 4X1 TES is applied over the motor cortex, you will get an electric field in the motor strip, and this should produce a muscle twitch. However, if you displace the ring, either anterior or posterior, the models predicted that you will no longer get a significant electric field in the motor region and therefore no response. And when we did this experiment uh, um, in these positions and also in between positions, the experiments corroborated what the models predicted. So this is really, TS is rather painful and so you're not going to be doing this uh, routinely, but for the purpose of illustrating focality, uh, this was a very nice illustration that the current was indeed restricted to under the ring. Uh, and at least for the resolution that we looked at, uh, the focality appeared comparable to TMS. And something else so very striking came, for me anyways, came out of the study, which is we did this on multiple people. So you can tell this is me and there were, there were two other subjects. And so we did this experiment on three subjects altogether and we also did individualized modeling for each subject. And what we found were very large differences in susceptibility or sensitivity to electric field. So first, uh, here you can see this would be the example of, of my head. And we did two different experiments. In one experiment, we kept increasing the intensity until you got a threshold MEP. And that's shown in the left row. Now the threshold for me, it's crop, cropped, you can't see it here, was 1,000 volts. Essentially, the, that digit timer stimulator was maxed out. And that was necessary to induce an MEP. Also very painful. Um, um, also painful, but perhaps less so, was for the other two subjects who needed half as much intensity as I did to produce a comparable MEP. And indeed, it turns out that I have a, a, a relatively large head. Uh, uh, we did another experiment. In this case, every subject received the exact same intensity, so 600 volts. And here you saw similar behavior. 600 volts on my head produced no response. Uh, and the model predicted, indeed, not much electric field, while 600 volts did produce a large response in the other two subjects. So what we're looking at here is a, a, at least a, a two-fold change in the amount of electric field intensity that is reaching the brain just across three subjects. And if you think about it, of course, this is very obvious. We, we all have uh, very diff differently shaped heads. So in addition to using models to think about what is the uh, best dose, there is also the possibility of using models to think about dose normalization and should everyone get the exact same thing. Of course, in TMS it's understood that you should not give everyone the same thing, that there are very large differences. Now in TDCS, you don't have that immediate evoked response. It's very hard to say, oh, on my head, I should be getting twice as much of current as, as someone else in the room. You don't have that sort of immediate twitch in order to be able to resolve that. Models, by linking the outside dose to the inside, give you the ability to do that. And again, uh, this was from a, uh, uh, a modeling study to support a, um, uh, a craving TCS study uh, looking at um, super obese subjects. Um, and what we learned from this study actually, uh, and these are some, again, references I'll, I'll include at the end. What we learned from the study is, of course, super obese subjects have a different amount of fat on their head. But even more important is how different our head shapes are and our head anatomies is even across subjects with comparable boss ma um, body mass index. Even when you're using, let's say, the 1010 or the 1020 EEG system on two people, the distance between electrodes is not the same. The skull thickness under each one of those electrodes is not the same. Never mind, of course, all the, the brain folding and so on. And so, you know, everything is obvious in retrospect. You give all these subjects the same TCS dose, the electric field flow in their head will not be the same. Uh, and finally, this brings me to, to the last point that I'll, that I'll only touch on, which is thinking about more susceptible populations. So for example, children. If you're seeing a two to three fold variation across normal healthy adults, you can extrapolate about how much variation you'll see when you'll move into a pediatric population, which has different tissue properties, much thinner skulls, and so on. And, and it's a very relevant question as the uh, intensity with which pediatric trials is being accelerated 
whether a four-year-old kid or a six-year-old kid should receive the full two milliamp dose that an adult should do. And if not, models are the tools to allow you to make that titration. So these are ongoing studies, similarly in, in stroke and other situations where you have brain injury. So if you have a skull defect or a portion of your brain has been destroyed due to a stroke and replaced with CSF, the current flow will not be the same. And models allow you to bridge that. Um, so this was the reference I alluded to earlier. I'll, I'll, by tonight, I'll have the talk um, loaded. And so you can look at all these references. Um, these are some additional uh, modeling, web-based um, free modeling resources that you can explore. Uh, and this paper uh, cites um, the many modeling studies that I, I didn't have a chance to, to allude to. It'll give you a, a bird's eye view of the modeling activity and, and the questions being asked, including in susceptible subjects. So thank you for your attention. So this was well in time, so we have time for questions. Yes, I have a question over here. Um, two thirds of the cortex is buried in the cell side. You've been showing us maps of the brain in which, which are folded. Is it a custom in this field to actually do um, expanded or blown up maps of the cortex so you can actually see what's going on inside the cell side? Because it would seem to me to be helpful if you could do that. That's, that's an excellent. So the, the, the question was, you know, the, the, the way we're representing the data gives you a very limited view of what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and this is something Paige were alluded to is more. As of now, I'm not sure if there are strict any strict conventions to how data is represented. When, one of the things we've done with, with um, Bonsai, which is, a, which is an online, in any paper, you just can't show everything, right? You would need hundreds and hundreds of figures. And so what we've done with Bonsai if, is, is, again, it's, it's, a, it's a free web-based toolkit, is you can actually go to a montage, and you can select any cross-sections that you want, horizontal, coronal, you can navigate through the brain, co-register that with the MRI, and... Um, because of course, if you if you did whatever representation you do, someone's going to want to see something else. But the blown up representation, which I think is done with some imaging techniques, oh yeah, it's straightforward. Now. Would be a valuable would actually be a valuable addition for exactly the, the issues that Pedro was mentioning. There's a lot of action inside the yeah, app. It's a good point. Okay, so let's come on. You made the point that you should have the same dose in every subject. But what do we know about effects? Physiological effects uh, concerning this same dose. Do you really think that your variation you observed in the motor cortex is only related to uh, different doses, or is there a different threshold for, for an individual brain? That is a very so the question. So that's a, that's a very uh, acute question. Everything I've shown you before shows current flowing through the head, uh, but the question is if you have the same amount of current flowing through my brain as someone else's brain. Will you respond identically? For the, for the TS experiment, I was actually a little bit surprised that the experiment tracked the modeling so well, because it seemed to suggest that indeed, for at least for TES, the way we were applying it in the motor cortex, that was the case. Roughly the same amount of electric field uh, across brains would be important. But I am struck, when, when we were looking, for example, at the pediatric situation, I was struck by the situation with TMS, where my understanding is the threshold for triggering uh, responses, motor responses in children is much higher. Yet we know the electric field should also be much higher. So there you have a situation where it is not sufficient simply to correct for the amount of electric field being delivered. You need to make other corrections. And so um, it, is a, it is a major limitation in what we're doing now, but I think this is still a, you still, it's a first step. It's certainly a first step. That was a good point. So, any more questions? <laughs> Okay, so I'm Max and 